Welcome back to Venshon Denshon, my YouTube channel. And it is an immense pleasure for me to welcome today's guest, none other than Rachel Atkinson, my very, very close friend from many decades, I can say now, cellist, chamber musician, teacher, head of the Music Academy at Camberwell Grammar. Welcome to the channel, Rachel. Thank you very much for having me, Jeff. Oh, it's such a pleasure. Now, Rachel, by now, everybody knows what my first question is going to be, and I'm not going to change it for you. In all of your playing life and teaching life and all of your musical life, just a few of the really memorable concerts and what makes them memorable to you. Oh, I think one of them would have to be uh, Royal Festival Hall 2014 playing at the proms. Uh, look, it was it was memorable for a number of reasons because my husband and I were back in London having studied there and we were there without our kids. So it was like a massive holiday slash honeymoon uh, slash sort of reconnecting with each other because we've been so busy. And there we are on the stage of the Royal uh, Festival Hall playing Don Juan and Symphony Fantastique with Sir Andrew Davis conducting. And it just felt really magical. It just felt that life had worked out as well as it possibly could have. So that was, it was, it was just fabulous. And, and it just felt, I just felt so proud and that the de decisions I'd made had been the correct ones. So that was one. Uh, another one would be going, going and playing to my son's uh, prep class and trying to tell them all about the ring cycle. And, <laughs> um, and, and, and it's funny because the teachers had sort of allotted half an hour. This is before I was actually working in a school that, that allotted half an hour for me to come and do, you know, when um, parents come and talk about what they do for a job and, um, I came and I brought a series of video clips and what have you. And an hour and a half later, I was still going. <laughs> um, and that was that was that was sort of fun because this this, this class of of um, six year olds want to know more about this opera and these crazy storylines. Um, so that was sort of fun. Um, and I just felt that this connection with music is possible with everybody and everyone has to be exposed to great music and that it's every musician's absolute duty to do what one can to expand our audience. So that's another very different type of experience. Absolutely wonderful. And just for people that might not know, when you're in London, that was with the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra, wasn't it? Oh, uh, yes, that's Absolutely, right. That's yep. right. Yep. And it's, yep. it, wow, that's really interesting to hear you talk about going into your to your son's prep class and it sounds the way you say it now as though it's quite vocational for you to to be doing what you're doing now to being the the head of the music academy so maybe why don't we dive straight into that what's it like okay, what does it right. mean to be the head of the music academy at Campbell Grammar for those of you that aren't in Melbourne Campbell Grammar is one of Melbourne's really top independent schools with a fantastic music program. So what does that mean, Rachel? And what do you do in that job? Okay, so I look after all the students who want, for whom music is a really big part of their life. Um, I create this program for them, similar to a European conservatory model where music becomes an enormous part of their school day. So they have all their academic classes. And so with, when it comes to language uh, and maths and science and English, I don't touch those, they become, they're sort of sacred. Uh, and so is art and actually so is PE because it's so important for mental health. Uh, but I just pack in their day with chamber music, with uh, technique class, uh, with uh, exposure to other musicians uh, and musical experiences. So basically it's as rich a musical education as you possibly can get at an advanced level. That's absolutely amazing. So are these kids from year seven to 12 or even younger? Uh, even year six and above, because we have some phenomenal young musicians. Year six is a fab fabulous age because uh, 
there, there's such a freedom and there's such a lack of inhibition at that age. So yeah, I have some fantastic year six pianists and cellists actually. Uh, so, and when they start, when they start year seven, the academic load gets significantly greater. So um, yeah, six, year six is great. Mind you, so is year 12 with all the pressures of VCE. Um, it's, it's all great. Every year level has its beauty and has its challenges. So it's interesting to hear you say that because for me as a classroom teacher and now as an online math teacher, year five, six is definitely my sweet spot for exactly the yeah. reason you said those year five and six kids, they're old enough to be sophisticated, but they're still young enough that they don't have to do anything. They don't have to be cool. They don't have to do anything. They can still show their enthusiasm and they can still follow me in my madness, in my rabbit, because we like to dive down rabbit holes and they're, yes. they're really willing to dive down them with abandon. So I, year five and six, I definitely can understand that. So I know some of the members of your faculty are, are top performing musicians. So yes. what sort of qualities do you look for when you're hiring people to be the teachers there? Well, uh, it's great if they are industry based and I got my job because I am from non-traditional uh, teaching background. So having spent uh, 25 years in Melbourne Symphony Orchestra and being an active chamber musician, but also having organised festivals and um, generated sponsorship for my quartet or whatever I've been doing, uh, I don't have to generate. Um, sponsorship now but the fact that I've been able to manage all that and manage a budget that's they were basically looking for those skills and I think it's important to realize the musicians generally have a lot of skills you know when you think of us practicing in a practice room for 10 hours a day at some part of our lives but in order to survive we have we become brilliant marketers and we and brilliant promoters and communicators writers of uh, of articles now it gets to the point we have to almost write our own reviews so I think um, you know we all have so many skills and when the school advertised they advertised for a head of sports academy and a head of um, music academy uh, they, they certainly wanted someone who was not from that traditional background of teacher ah, okay so that's how that works great yeah I want to dive back all the way back to Sydney in the 80s, which um, was a very special time for me. And that was where we met. I think we met in the Sydney Youth Orchestra in 1986, probably, I would say. Yes, I think and that's true. You and I, we've talked about what an amazing time it was being a, a, a music student back in those days. What was so special about it for you? Uh well, I'd come from New Zealand and there was no such thing as a conservatorium of music. So uh, there was just, you know, university faculties where everything was sort of uh, more academic and there wasn't really a performance faculty. So to come to the Sydney Con, I just felt that I was in a fairyland uh, and everything was magical. The fact that I was with all these high caliber students who were really committed was was just such a was such a dream. So, I also had the most wonderful teacher, Gail Pedersen, who's still teaching at the con, and he's wow. just turned seventy five, and it blows my mind that I'm now ten years older than he was when he taught me. Because you know, I just yeah, you know, I just think that's really whoa, confronting. Uh, so I just enjoy. I had two lessons a week. And now when I teach students who are committed, I teach them two, two lessons a week regardless. And I just think, I just try and um, recreate what I had. Uh, I, just, I just feel, I mean, I remember saying this to Richard Gill a few years ago, that, that uh, I know what it takes and I'm determined to reproduce that even if the environment around me isn't right. So I'm lucky that I've produced this environment now in where, where I work, but it's not available to all students and it's certainly not available in tertiary institutions where we are now. So I was very lucky to have, and we were both really lucky to have had to be, had those opportunities. It did seem like we had an immense amount of opportunities for me and I'm forever grateful to my teachers and not just my teachers, but all of the people in the profession, because I was really just a kid going along playing as a casual in the orchestras. And yes. they were so welcoming to me. And so, you know, and I was 
it's not, I'm not afraid to admit it. I was a very brash young fellow. And, but the, the, the profession was so welcoming and so willing to teach. And we were, there were so many availabilities for going to so many concerts we could go to concerts we could play in. And as you said, I don't know whether it's golden age thinking, but it did really seem like there was a bunch of us who were really committed, like we were living and breathing it. And I guess, I guess it's like that everywhere, but it felt very special. And it's interesting to me how I remember those years in the mid and late eighties so clearly, even though it's, you know, it's such a long time ago. I remember them clearly. So you did your, I think it was called a, a DSCM, or did DSCM, you do the dip- right. so you did your diploma, yeah. and then what? Then what did you do after um, you did that? Then I went I left. to London. That's right, because you went off to work. You you were, <laughs> you, you were no longer a student. Um, so I went off to London and studied at the Royal Academy of Music, which I have to say was challenging after Sydney because I adored my teachers so much in Sydney that when I got to London, I found. I found it really ha- uh, hard to to bond with my teacher. I mean, he was a famous teacher, and I felt this enormous pressure to just be in awe of him and, and to to get the most out I c- could out of this extraordinary experience of studying in London. But um, I, you know, I struggled. I found London difficult. I found socially, I found look to be honest, I found the British British students at the uh, at the Royal Academy. I found them socially not as, there wasn't, wasn't as much equality amongst male and female students. I found them quite conservative. And I'd come from an environment where I could say anything to Georg and ask any question and challenge and be challenged. Whereas I found in London, there was this sort of uh, dryness and this sort of, uh, you know, a game to be played. And I found that well, I had to learn how to play it, and I, I did. But I, I found that a bit disheartening at times. So there was that juxtaposed with extraordinary performances and great artists. I mean, Arnold Sophie Mortel was there, Lynn Harrell was there. Uh, but I found, and, and also the Amadeus Quartet, I, I, I saw them twice a week. And it's funny because they used to say, you're not British, are you? You're you're." Are you American? Where, where are you from? And I and it was just because I was sort of open and sort of a bit crazy and probably a bit brash, Jeff. Um, and I just loved they, they were terrific. They were older, and of course they were Aust- you know they were um, they'd been refugees from the Second World War, and they just gave everything. They were fantastic. So I got a lot out of that. But L- London was you know it was a t- it's a tough town when you're when you're twenty. And my, I mean, my oldest son is 20 now. And the idea of him living alone in London is studying viola. Forget it. There's no way I'd let him do that because so, it's so tough. So anyway, he's not studying music. He's studying something else. So, yeah. That's amazing for me to hear that you were in contact with the Amadeus Quartet for a couple of reasons. One, that was the first complete Beethoven cycle that I owned on CD was with the Amadeus Quartet. Wow. And I loved it dearly. I especially the later ones. And people who know me know that I'm a, just a softy for 135. I, I, you know, just from the Milan Kunderis, Musain and all of that. But oh, yeah. that you, so when you were getting to hear them, were they teaching or performing? What was that? What was no, the they were just teaching because Peter Shidloff, their violist, had just passed away. So they were, the three of them were, so the three, three remaining, Norbert Brainin, uh, Sigmund Nissel and Martin Lovett. And Martin Lovett's only passed away a couple of, couple of years ago. Uh, they, you know, there were three remaining musicians were teaching full time at the academy. So it was we took we took quartets. We'd also took piano trios. I, I actually I used to just take my repertoire to, to them because and Martin Lovett used to say, "Do you want to go on my strad? You want to have a go?" I say, "Yeah, oh yeah." And, <laughs> It was just, that, that was fantastic. And I actually, uh, last week I performed a piano, an early piano trio of Beethoven arranged for piano quintet by Beethoven himself with Wilma Smith and Kurt Thompson at, at, at the um, conservatorium and um, two younger players, um, Anthony Chataway from MSO and Ruby um, Shiraz, who's at... Um, and am, uh, and we performed a, a Beethoven's arrangement of that, and I could still remember 
Sigmund Nissel's words all the time about this trio, which is now, which we were playing as a quintet. So those words are still in, and we still, when we rehearse quartet, we still remember the funny jokes they used to crack. And it was because of course my husband, I met my husband at the Royal Academy and he studied with these same people. So we, we managed to keep it all alive, all those lovely anecdotes and funny things that used to happen. That's amazing to me. I didn't realize that your quartet, the Fidelio Quartet, had that connection to the Amadeus Quartet that two of you studied closely with them. And that yes. really, that matches a lot of my ideas about, in martial arts, we talk about lineage. And also oh. when I was talking to Mick Mulcahy about the schools of playing in Germany, how the teacher would pass the art on to their students, so that's yes. phenomenally interesting to me to think that your connection to through quartets, and I think that's an excellent moment to start talking about the Fidelio Quartet. Oh, yes. Because that's your quartet, and you've, of course, done a huge amount of performing in Melbourne. You've done a Beethoven cycle. So what was yes. the... Maybe we're jumping around a bit because you did you when did the Fidelio Quartet start? How long had you been back in Melbourne? Uh, well, a while. We done. We had a we'd had a piano trio. We had. I also had an, um, a Baroque ensemble of Ottoman court musicians. That's of another. Uh, yeah, that's another chapter. So uh, basically, we've done all these terrific projects. But then, about six years ago, uh, we got together with. Bobby Mackendo, who's uh, he was a bit of a mentor for Ishan and MSO. He was you know, a little bit older, and when Ishan first joined MSO, little of us had had a lot of orchestral experience, actually. And and I just think this is every, any job you often learn it on the job. And uh, Bobby was a great support to Ishan, uh, and so those two are great friends and um, Lisa Grosman, our violist, had just arrived from Ireland to Australia and uh, we, we, look, we just formed this quartet and we thought, what are we going to play? And we thought, well, I've been playing what other people have asked me to play really for the last 20 years because in an orchestra you just you know, get what you get, you don't get upset. And you play how, you know, you just, you have very little rights about what you do. So we thought, let's play what we want to play. So that was the Beethoven cycle. And we, we just studied it and worked extraordinarily hard. And uh, we gave ourselves about 18 months preparation. And then we performed it over three years at the Melbourne Recital Centre. So it was a bit of a crazy project, but it was just, it just felt right because we'd played the Beethoven symphonies over and over again with every new chief conductor. We did the Beethoven cycle of symphonies. We'd played, I'd played all the cello sonatas. Ishin had played most of the violin sonatas. We'd played all the trios. So it just felt, it just felt right. It felt our symphonic background and our knowledge of chamber music gave us, we felt it, it sort of we'd earned the right to play these pieces rather than having played in a quartet for the last 20 years. We felt our relationship with Beethoven and with Western classical music and with life, we, we, we felt we'd earned the right to do that. So, so we did it, but it was a huge amount of work. And we, we became paranoid about intonation and all those things that all quartets worry about. It's a wonderful obsession to have. You never have that when you play with a piano. So it's interesting yeah. that you mentioned that because that's actually one thing I want to dig into a little bit. But first of all, I think that a lot of people watching this um, watching this interview, a lot of them might not be string players. A lot of them will probably ah. be trumpet players and brass players. So can ah. you talk a little bit about the role of the cello in the string quartet and also how you actually train the intonation of the quartet the actual the actual the nuts and bolts of how you do it right well a lot of it depends oh, there are keys of course that are great and there are keys that are problematic anything in f major is a disaster but anyway um but so it's quartet it, it, what about the the, the number one in oh, f major? I know. yes i know whenever yes whenever he starts a new opus it's with the f major However, um, so any, any key that's with an open string, of course you have all that resonance and it's fabulous. Uh, so 
my role, obviously, well, I, my, my role is to match the first violin. So I spend a lot of time doing slow practice with the first violin, matching the intonation. We get that right first. Uh, there comes a point, if I'm not quite strong enough, the bottom will fall out of the intonation. So sometimes intonation is balance as well. Uh, so we go through, we find all the fourths and the fifths. We, we tune those firsts, or the thirds and sixths, of course, they just play it themselves. Um, so we, we work out um, the voice, thing, voice exchanges uh, when, we, when the same pitch is passed around, making sure that they are um, completely accurate. So it's just, it's basically, you just comb through, it's like looking for landmines in a, in a, in a field. You just comb through, uh, quite often our music will have little arrows going up and down for sometimes every note, particularly Lisa and I, the violist and myself, uh, creating the perfect intonation carpet for the violins. So it, for all of us, until we, we cannot, we, we, we basically have to be uh, playing in such a defensive and yet committed and spirited way where we are able to change the pitch at any time to match the others. I want to ask a question because you said thirds and sixths just are, are they work easily because for me in as a trumpet player I have yeah. to be very careful that I bring my thirds down a little bit otherwise you know they don't to make them to make them resonate and so what do you mean by thirds and sixths are so easy what is that why why do you say oh, they're that easy, they're easy to place in comparison to the fourths and fifths okay. so I find the fourths and fifths are so pure that they they're just yeah I find so that I guess they're easy just easy to hear and they the, the way they move it's just somehow maybe yeah, that's just, uh, but I, I, the skills we developed, we had to develop a whole set of, um, a whole set of skills and Lisa coming from the Irish Chamber Orchestra, her, her experience in tuning, she was a little bit like the boss of tuning. So that was really, she sort of unleashed all her skills onto us. Whereas now when I'm in other environments, I feel I know what to do. If something's out of tune, I feel I know how to fix it. So if you've worked in an orchestra all your life or played with pianos all your life, it's unlikely you're going to have those skills because it's impossible to play in tune with, you know, a piano or, or an orchestra. So. <laughs> you, can't, you, can't say, you can't say this is going to be broadcast. No, I know. Don't tell anyone when I said that. But you know what I mean? It, it, <laughs> That's so. And yet, and yet. There are orchestras that do achieve a certain resonance. Yes. And I think, I think it, it my I have a personal opinion. I think it's achieved when everyone's listening to the basses and the cellos. That was oh. that used to be my um reference to being yep. to, you know, but I mean it's of, of course it depends on who's got what voice and what's going on. Yes. So, yep. so that's that's about rehearsing. Hmm. What about in concert so you've we, how do you how do you marry this idea because i'm a bit interested in what you said you have to be defensive but in a concert yep. you can't be defensive so then i what? feel i feel with this part of you you need to play you need to know your part so well that you can still fix it before it happens i i don't know it's it's, it's this thing would be so well rehearsed that if my colleague, especially in the violin, you know, in high violin playing, I, I feel that I can just, I'm just so tuned in that I'm able to change what I perhaps would have done. So, I mean, it, maybe it's just a type of, we, we just would rehearse so much that, uh, yeah, I, I feel it is a form, when it comes to intonation, I feel it's slightly, I'm always able to move quickly or a malleability rather than a defensiveness, I suppose. Right. No, musically, we're exactly what we're doing and we go for it. But when it comes to the pitch, there's always an openness or a ability to, to alter depending on what's going on. But having said that, I mean, I wouldn't know that I've done it. I just, you know, until I, do you know what I mean? It's just, I do, so it's, I do. It becomes so instinctive. It's great talking about it because I, I haven't actually talked about it like this. I just sort of, you know, it's just a, 
it's something that I've been interested in for a long time. And I'm actually purposefully going to be interviewing people who play in quartets. And so I've yep. got you as my, I've got a, a first violinist from another quartet that I'm going to interview. Because right. I'm really interested in this because, I mean, not just because you're here, I do consider the string quartet to be one of the, you know, one of the amazing art forms that we have. And, you know, it just so happens that you have cycles from mm. some of my favourite composers as well. And when you think about this Beethoven cycle, I'm going to hone in a little bit. What are your personally, your which are your favourite quartets and why do you love them so much? Well, I love 127. And, also do uh, I. Yeah, I just feel... It's, it's just so optimistic. It's just the sun comes out. It's got the thrill of being alive. Um, I always, during the pandemic, um, we performed 132, then we did 131. 132 we did at the beginning of the pandemic when things looked like, oh, well, you know, we've got a lot of time off work. This is fun. No one's going to school. And then 132 we performed when the case numbers were really high. And um, this was for Melbourne Digital Concert Hall. And uh, but one two seven was the was the quartet for the vaccine or the quartet for not for, for zero cases. Um, it's we, we've, it's how lucky are we to have lived? So that's my favourite. Uh, I'm also I love the Razumovskis. Uh, we always found the Opus 18s the most difficult to perform because somehow. They were they had a de they, they were so delicate and yet technically there was a purity about them that was a little bit menacing and confronting <laughs> and it used to the violinists were always obsessed with them and freaking out and became obsessive so that sort of it, it, it that um, carried through to us even though we didn't have such technically demanding parts uh, so yeah I'd say one two seven one three two one three one I like one three five, but not 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 I, emotionally. I'm not as connected with it as those others that I mentioned. Uh, yeah, I mean, I love them all. I mean, they, they, it's it's you know, hard to choose favorites, but yeah, I suppose one two seven, one three two, one three one. That's yeah, I, I can I can see what you mean. You mentioned the Melbourne Digital Concert Hall, and that kind of brings yes. me to something else I'd like to talk to you about. What has your experience been as a musician in the pandemic? And in Melbourne, we have to acknowledge that we are in a much more comfortable position than so many of our musical colleagues in Europe and in America. I think of my friends in Germany and Switzerland and France and all over Europe, actually. But what's your experience been like? Uh, well, uh, hard work because because I was working in a school I uh, a typical day in August last year would be getting up at six uh, quickly listening to the recordings of my students who had sent them to me between midnight and 2 a.m because um, because wow. it's a boys school a lot of the boys became addicted to screens or they weren't sleeping so I had to deal with uh, a whole lot of social issues and I had my role was was to be very very supportive so some boys were not coming turning up to class on zoom but they were practicing so rather than having a go at them for wagging school and practicing their instrument I thought the best thing I can do is to challenge them and support them through their musical studies and keep the teachers and the the, the therapists at school um, informed that they were actually they were around. I mean, they're with me. They're safe. So, so I basically, I would listen to recordings and I'd teach during the day. Then I would hold tutorials, orchestral tutorials, chamber music rehearsals. Can you imagine? Or chamber music rehearsals, which would mean bringing, listening to all everyone's parts with metronome and click track. Then we'd put them together. Then at about, so then, then I'd break for dinner between eight and nine, and then I would be listening to all the other recordings that came in. With Zoom, you really have to rely on recordings. So it was just listening to recordings, editing them and giving feedback, and then and more recordings would come the next day. I did that for about 28 students. So wow. it was just, it was incredible, but it was also uh, valuable. We had scales competitions we had excerpt competitions. 
we had study competitions and for the winner of the scale competition got a pizza delivered to the house. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, there were a lot of joyous times as well, but it was, it was tough. And some students only now are recovering. So the recovering from screen addiction, the recovering from lack of exercise for their man mental health, the recovering from not really listening to their colleagues because they were playing always alone and not with someone else. So with chamber music, they're only now just coming right. They're only now re-listening to each other more than listening to themselves. And that's taken a good oh, six months to fix because they're young. So, you know, a year without playing with each other is, is really, really tough. So, so that was a pandemic. On top of that, we had our quartet um, rehearsals which were for a while we couldn't rehearse because during the harshest lockdown, we couldn't because we weren't allowed to travel within 5K. Uh, and we, we had a curfew. We couldn't leave the house, as you know, after eight, eight o'clock. Mm. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was tough, but I was lucky because we had an income and of course, so many people didn't. So there you are. Wow. That's that workload for you just sounds immense just thinking about it. And because I know that you do things, you're <laughs> a lot of my guests are as venchon denchon as I am, but that sounds like a serious, like receiving that and you would have cared about the, the students and wanting to give them the best support that you could and acknowledging their situation and everything. I, yeah. I, I hadn't even, I hadn't even considered what that would have been like. That must've been, a really tough time for them and for, yeah, for everyone. For yeah. Amazing. The, the thing, funnily enough, when school resumed, I found it really hard to adjust actually going back to school. After all that, that became the norm. And I sort of had this crazy drive. And then when I got back to school, I found I had to actually negotiate with other colleagues. And that was actually hard because what I did like was the fact I could make decisions uh, and work very quickly. So I, I sort of did enjoy that, that aspect. I also have to say my colleagues in Melbourne Symphony were really helpful because they did a lot of the adjudicating of all these competitions. Okay. So that was really fun. So I'd have uh, someone like Rachel Tobin, Associate Principal Cellist of MSO, listen to all these popper studies and write reports or uh, Matt Tompkins. So they, so I, I, there was a bit of, um, it was lovely exposing these students to these great musicians who weren't, me, you know, like, you know, non-familiar faces. Uh, so it was it was dynamic. I had to get really um, pally with the IT department at school because, you know, I'd, I'd get sent a file and I couldn't open it and they would just be, they were knights in shining armour. So um, that was, yeah, it was like, it was a, Look, the, with the pandemic, you had to learn new skills. You had to come up with fresh ideas. And if you couldn't do that, then you were sunk. And I just think we've seen that in business as well. You know, it's just, it was an opportunity and you either had to you know, rise to the occasion or not. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Um, just tell us a little bit about your experience with the quartet and the Melbourne Digital Concert Hall, because some of my, oh, yeah. some of the listeners, they won't, they won't even know what that is. So what was the idea behind that? Because I think you've performed a few a few different yes. groups for that. So tell us a little bit about, the, about that, the Melbourne Digital Concert Hall. So basically, Chris Howlett, who ran it, uh, he, look, there was a lot of outrage in Melbourne um, about how the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra was treated because they were immediately all stood down. Uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about this, but management were not, but the players were. So... All, so the um, players were put on JobKeeper, which was the government subsidy, which is 40% basically of their income. Uh, and management will put on 80% of their income. We're not sure what management were actually doing during that time because there were no musicians to manage. But uh, the M Melbourne Digital Concert Hall came out of this desire to help musicians uh, perform, to keep in form, and in some cases, uh, financially help some of these musicians. Uh, so a lot of the MSO players performed regularly uh, and uh, in an in a empty theatre and the, the concerts were filmed and you could purchase a ticket and watch it on your computer. 
uh, and it was live. You couldn't watch it later. You had to watch it there. So it felt really real and authentic. Uh, the, the camera work was terrific and the sound quality was good. So it was, it was remarkable how effective it was. You know, at first we were all a bit like, oh, it's not the real thing. But it, it felt, it was quite moving actually watching my colleagues perform. And then we performed ourselves. I mean, it was, it was challenging because there's no audience. So halfway through you start sort of sagging a bit or feeling really tired because there's no audience to bounce from. But sorry, to, to bounce off. Uh, but it was just, it, it really kept so many people going and it was just a total gift. So I think Chris Howlett's done an extraordinary job and this will be the making of him. I mean, he was the man that saved Melbourne music during the pandemic and no one will forget that. Yeah, I've certainly I've certainly watched a few of the concerts and it has been it has been a real a bit of a beacon for, for musical life, both for performers and for concert goers. I actually I actually quite like being able to watch concerts from home. I'm, I, I like staying at home. So for me, but it has been wonderful. Yeah, Rachel, that was a delightful whirlwind tour we went to we were in sydney we we're in melbourne we we're in london and you've shared so much of your art and your ideas and your wisdom i'm sure that people will watch this interview more than once i know i will to pick up all the nuggets i just want to thank you immensely for being my oh, guest on the channel thank you, oh my pleasure i so hope I'm, it's okay it's <laughs> Wonderful. I'm going to say farewell to the audience.